<laughs> so additive manufacturing, if you haven't heard the term, is the fancy uh, name for 3D printing. Because when you're looking in the literature, more often than not, you'll find additive manufacturing used across all um, sciences. Like in dentistry, you'll see a lot more 3D printing, but much of the research you're going to find in polymer journals or engineering journals, and it's always going to be additive manufacturing. I always joke with the philosophy of prosthodontic terms that they always come up with a long, ridiculous name that no one else knows what it means. Similar here. So we have additive manufacturing as opposed to 3D printing. Uh, whenever I talk about 3D printing, I usually start with some sort of goofy story as uh, a good example. And so when you learn 3D printing, just in the old days of learning to cast gold, you become an amateur jeweler. Nowadays, you become an amateur toy maker, so I always have my little octopi around. This is my little boy. He was, he was three at the time at Christmas. I made him uh, a rocket and a little Astro Boy. And when he looked at it, he told me, Daddy, he needs a space doggy. I'm like, well, of course. What space boy doesn't need a space doggy? But having spent time learning the techniques of 3D modeling, 3D printing, is it's a very quick change to then make a little space <laughs> doggy. I frequently say that you know your real limitations are creativity and tolerance for frustration. And it's mostly the latter, is you can do anything if you're willing to spend the time. And the first 100 or so hours spent in this field is a very frustrating 100 hours and far less productive than the average hour once you're beyond that learning curve. But it's something that I'm pretty stubborn. And when I want to do something, I'm going to keep pushing forward until I figure out how to make it happen, whether or not it wasted a lot of time, money, and effort. But I mean, come out the other end, and just for his birthday this past week, I made giant Tyrannosaurus Rex skulls to bury in our sand pit for a. Uh, Scavenger hunt, which is a lot of fun. I mean, in a more practical sense, if you think of dental prostheses, traditionally you make them via lost wax casting technique. I mean, this is an ancient technique of um, a way that really works with metal. I mean, you can cast ceramics and other materials, but if you think of how we're making a crown, or even going back to dentures with a metal base, is it's essentially a lost wax casting. I mean, the Etruscans were doing this thousand plus years ago. You can do pack and process, which is not that different of a process, more so with acrylic. And then they're stacking sort of a powder and liquid building of something that you're then firing. <clears throat> Each of these different techniques were limited by this fabrication method. When you look at how well ceramics perform, most of the time the failure in, say, a PFM was going to be the layers is because you're not getting perfect layers when you're hand stacking it. You're going to have voids, you're going to have air bubbles, and you're going to have a weak spot that leads to chipping. And so then when we switched over to like a CAD CAM process with feldspathic porcelains, they're not all that strong in and of themselves. Yet when you have a laboratory-made ceramic ingot that you mill, you can have significantly better long-term um, use when it's the exact same material. It's just manufactured through a different process with fewer errors. And we're seeing a huge change with this. And so there's yeah, a huge sea change in the fabrication of dental prostheses. I mean, it's still going. And it, every year, the amount of available literature, I mean, it's on an exponential curve at this point, especially in 3D printing. In, Another bit of context is just the sort of process of moving out of the digital, or out of the physical world, into the digital world, and then back to the physical world. If you think of you know, a crown that you're going to prepare, you're then going to scan it, so then you're entering the digital world, you're going to need to get your 3D data file, and then you're going to need to get that into your CAD design platform. And then that CAD file needs to be converted into a CAM file of some sort to actually manufacture it, whether you're printing or milling or some other process. And then it comes back into the physical world, and then you have to then process that, in this case, printed item. You know, just with any physical process, the end result is the accumulation of all the errors up to that point, and so much of success is just making fewer errors. And then they, the more digital the process, in theory, the fewer errors you have the opportunity of introducing. But this is entirely new, so what are the errors that we're introducing? We all know what happens if we put in too much composite and try to light cure it. Now, we understand a lot of the limitations of traditional fabrication techniques. A lot of these are newer. And so if you look at the accuracy of a 3D printed model, you're going to have to look at what type of 3D printing was used, how they post-process, what percentage alcohol, if they use alcohol, they use some other solvent. And there are so many possible choices that you know, we may not know what the correct thing is. I mean, there's enough research out there to have a pretty good idea of how to remain consistent with your processing to minimize errors, but it's still not a lot known. 
So I always, you know, again, have these octopi. There's a bunch on my desk. I frequently have them because when you pick one up, you can't not play with them just the way all those tentacles <laughs> move around. And part of the reason I have this file is that this is something that you can't really make any other way without a lot of time spent individually fabricating. So this octopus is printed as one component. It all prints at the same time, builds layer upon layer. As you can get interdigitations, as long as you're doing you know, 50 microns or 100 microns at a time, you can build things that interdigitate in a way that you can't really do other than you know, I think of somebody making chain links, an old-fashioned way of bending each piece together and soldering. With this, you're building it all at the same time. So with printing, you can make complex geometries and things that you can't really make otherwise. Printing can be very fast, but it doesn't have to be. It tends to be very inexpensive. So a, a example that I use a fair amount is like for dentures. If we 3D print a denture, the materials cost is usually around five to eight dollars. And so you can get very low. There are permanent crown resins that you print a crown and it's about a dollar fifty worth of material. And so your materials cost goes down substantially. I mean, you obviously have to have the equipment, which can be expensive, and then the knowledge, which is you know, harder to come by at this stage. But you're able to rapidly produce things that are going to be reproducible across time for a low per unit cost, which has a lot of benefits in an educational setting. I mean, patient care, obviously, each thing is going to be individualized to that patient, but there's a lot of ways to reduce per unit cost. And the drawbacks is that they're messy. The products tend to be weaker than milled. There is some change in that in the uh, metal 3D printing world. Uh, somebody had turned me on this a couple of weeks ago. I didn't realize it was a thing, is that there are certain ways that you can print metals like titanium to improve their mechanical properties. I think it has to do with the lattice of how they here, you know, melt each layer and changing sort of a rebuilding Kevlar and angling each layer. That seems to work with metals. And who knows if that's uh, something that's going to continue to pan out. Because initially, if you 3D printed the product, it was going to be weaker. But even that's changing. And a lot of the times, we're using this for rapid production. One of the earlier terms for stereolithography, which was the most common method of 3D printing, was called rapid prototyping. And you'll still see RP as the acronym for 3D printing in some literature. And so it's something that I'm sure everybody here has had something or seen somewhere, something that was made via stereolithography. It's been around since the 80s. It was just very expensive and a very slow process to get anything made. I've talked to surgeons that when they were residents in the 80s had to get a mandible made to bend uh, plating, and it took six weeks and well over $1,000 to get it when, you know, if we had a cone beam, we could have, you know, a printed mandible in your hand for $1.50 in two hours. I mean, it's one of those that, as the technology gets more common and more is understood, it then becomes cheaper, more readily available, simpler. <clears throat> and the main thing to compare to is milling, which it now has highest accuracy. And every time I give a presentation on 3D printing, I have to check to see whether printing or milling is they're constantly getting past each other. But then it gets to the point of, for what we do, is it good enough? And most types of printing now, you get to a minimum feature size of less than 50 microns, which is pretty darn good for just about everything we do in dentistry. And with Millen, we still have more material choices, minimized processing, it's fast for single units, but you waste a lot of materials, and you don't have great scalability and volume production when you're milling. Now, if I wanted to mill 100 crowns, that's going to be the time of one crown times 100. If I want to 3D print 100 crowns, it might be the time of one crown times 5%. It's something that just depends on the type of technology you're using. You can really increase the output when you're printing. And just a little bit of background, um, types of 3D printing. You grab any two journals or even two articles in the same journal, you're going to have different ways it's broken apart. Um, for the most part, you know, with 3D printing, there are liquid resins with stereolithography based printers is you have liquid with something held in you can print ceramics this way is you have a liquid matrix with ceramic particles in there that are cured you then put it through one oven cycle to get rid of the resin then the other cycle to sinter the zirconia which is one of the materials out there and then there are material extrusion type which look like they have a giant spool of fishing line they're melting and depositing plastic which is how i make these guys then there's uh, powder based systems where you have powdered resins, powdered uh, polymers may soar, powdered metals that use a high intensity laser to melt these together. And that's primarily how metals are 3D printed. 
And then there's the material jetting, which are similar to a inkjet printer in the way they spray out a fine mist that's also UV cured at that moment. And so these printers can be large, they can make really intricate materials at the children's hospital. They have the stratuses they call the uh, digital anatomy printer because you can fit most of a person on there and you can print out a body with color-coded bones and organs and everything and that's primarily what they're used for making the surgical models. They can have all the different color-coded organs, life-size, you can take it to the OR and you have everything. So it, really neat type of printing, but there's very different fabrication processes for each one of these. And so some of them you can use acrylic type resins in most of these, but then which one's the strongest? Don't really know. It's like when we're looking at dentures, you know, whoever can figure out how to make a very good, very fast denture is going to be very valuable in the future. And so there's a lot of research into these different printing technologies. Right now, stereolithography, the liquid resin, is what we're mostly using to print a denture. The material jetting companies are experimenting in that, but right now we're all too weak. And so again, you know, essentially the same chemical components fabricated a different method, yielding different mechanical properties. And so this is very new, and a lot is not yet known about this. And it is the question of why am I interested in this? I mean, I find pretty much everything interesting. And so it's just one of those, uh, you know, just accursed with curiosity about everything. Um, and then one of those other underlying questions is I always find it uh, entertaining when something that everyone believes turns out to be wildly wrong. I, mean, I always like the example of the researcher figuring out about H. pylori causing ulcers. I mean, he was just some crazy guy in the basement of a hospital and nobody believed him. It wasn't that long ago that everybody turned out to be wrong. And so I always pose that question. It's like, all right, what are we doing today in dentistry that 20 years from now we're going to look back and I'm like, man, what were we thinking? <laughs> Probably something, but you never know. And so I always like to look in to see what's out there. I mean, everybody that's done research knows how often you go down a dead end. But you know, sometimes the crazy person off on the side is going to have a great idea that leads to us realizing that we're missing something obvious. So with additive manufacturing, if you look at PubMed and search 3D printed denture. Prior to 2010, in the English language, there was one result. Between 2010 and 2019, there's 82. Last year and a half, there's 91. And so this is something that is exploding in the literature. Um, there's just everything needs to be known. I mean, what's the color stability? You know, what's the, the wear property, flexural strength? Anything you can think of, we don't know yet. And then once it's figured out for one printer, that doesn't mean it applies to other printing methods. It probably doesn't. And then with the printing, there are hundreds of individual settings, how intense the laser is, how fast the laser comes on, how fast it goes off, how fast the printer raises up, whether or not it sits there and allows the curing to continue before it adds another layer. And then you get into the post-processing, the light curing, whether or not you cure it in an air inhibiting gel like glycerin, whether or not you cure it first and then put it in. So it, it's hard to even compare any studies that exist because there are so many ways to modify everything in this whole process. But then the other question is, you know, this is a great new technology. What can we do that we couldn't do before? So, I mean, there's rapid production of end-use prostheses, which is great. Ease of reproduction for loss of broken prostheses. And this has a lot to do with why I got interested in this, is replacing dentures. I mean, in private practice here in Lincoln, I have quite a few patients brought in from assisted care or memory care facilities. You make a brand new denture because they lost theirs, and then two weeks later they lose their denture. You have nothing from that whole process because when you make a denture, you break everything from the last step to make the next step. You go all the way through it, and you're back to square one. You know, it's something that you can archive and reproduce things in a way that you could not before. And again, raw materials become inexpensive, so you can experiment a lot easier with new types of things as well. You know, you make a denture, and you're like, ah, maybe this will work out. Make another one. And the equipment has become readily available. You can buy 3D printers capable of making a denture for $180 on Amazon. I mean, they've got really inexpensive. Then what do we know that we don't know we know? I mean, if you look at any of the specialties or something that might be common, that can very easily be applied elsewhere. And that was one of the things. I found uh, Dr. Stack, one of our recent Hendo graduates, when she was still a fourth year, and told her I had an idea of something I really wanted to try when you're a resident. And so we got the opportunity is we all know how to make a surgical guide. And when you're planning, you're putting a specific place of where you want this to be within bone. There's no reason you can't do the exact same thing inside of a tooth. 
So we had an instance where it was going to be a nightmare of an access. And I'm like, you know what? This is going to work. So you know, I've got a couple of extracted teeth to prove that I wasn't crazy, and then try this out to make essentially a surgical guide, but to access the tooth to get beyond. So this is our tooth here. Now, does anybody want to try to find this canal? <laughs> How about when you see the bridge it's connected to? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this was one that I like, planned it. And I stepped, I had Kai was in my office, we were doing this over lunch, and it's like, it was planned, everything looked perfect, and I'm like, this cannot be correct, because no one in their right mind would have accessed through this crown where it needed to be for straight line. And so again, zoomed in, you can see that's the tooth. Our plan once more, and designed it to where the burr hubbed out exactly where we needed it to be, and perfect. I mean, could not have hoped for a better result. I mean, just perfectly centered on the canal. And this is a technique and a technology that, I mean, making surgical guides like this has been an everyday use for well over a decade. Yeah, that was one of those. I'm like, this should work. I mean, why doesn't everybody do this? And so then I'm like, well, this works beautifully for teeth. What about for an implant crown? So a periodontist had heard of the cases that Kai and I were doing and had an instance where these were cemented implant crowns and the abutment is coming loose, so the screw is loosening. So, we're looking at this crown here. Now, how are you going to do that? Well, you're probably just out of habit going to treat it like a endo access and you're going to start making a giant hole trying to find the channel. So, same thing. We already know how we're planning. We have all the information. It's just how do we put it together differently. So, we pretend like we're placing an implant directly in line with that screw and we know exactly where it's going. And that's the angle which I never would have guessed. And it's a lot of these, once you realize that information is there, you're like, wow, I was going to be way off. And there it is. I mean, nice, clean, centered access right on the screw channel. And so it's information that's been readily available. It's just putting the pieces together of what's out there. And just another example. This was another case with uh, uh, Leslie Smith, our AGD resident from a couple of years ago. We had a RPD that we were going to make with guide planes necessary in places that I would not have been able or capable of making parallel cuts on the distal of second molars, and the mesial of first premolars, and the distal and lingual of all those centrals. And so we took the case, we scanned it, we created essentially a surgical guide with the correct insertion angle, with the correct guide plane access. So where she was able to put this in the patient's mouth as a burr guide, for all these parallel sides, and we're able to get an RPD fabricated that fit incredibly well. But then going back to being stubborn, like, I know there's a better way to do this. It was another case with a student. It's like, you know, I did something that worked in the past, but I bet I know a better way to do this. You know, the first time I made this full arch thing that's hard to get in the mouth, and then you're going to have slight shrinkage, which probably doesn't matter for a guy plane. But again, how can we improve on what's out there? In this instance, you know, go to the same digital software because you create models in an XYZ coordinate axis and everything can be oriented in the same plane. And so we create a bunch of little boxes in the exact same plane, move it across all the teeth that we want guide planes. And you can kind of see the small area of tooth held there. Make one here, make one here, there, and there. And they just, this is a, a new material that wasn't available when I started. This is a semi-rigid night guard material. So if you warm it up, you can move it on and then it locks into place on the tooth. So we made a bunch of individual boxes, warm them up, put them on, lock onto the tooth, and then we have our perfect guide plane. And it's just another application of this technology. These materials are there. It's just what can we do with the information that didn't know. And then another fun one, they did this to torture the AEGD residents with. You know, I'm going to make some dentures, and we did one as a group, and then when they left, I went back to the file and messed it up six different ways to teach them how you can make everything look wrong just by changing the position of the teeth. You know, they didn't know about us. They came in, and they were just all labeled, and I asked them, like, all right, what's wrong with this one? What's wrong with this one? Like, oh, the teeth are bigger here. It's like, these are the exact same teeth across all seven setups. And so it's a matter of, you know, it would take a... The personality that I don't have in order to make seven real wax ups of a denture. I mean, it would take forever. And it's something that allows you to do this for an educational setting. I mean, this is all well and good. In a practical setting, in a case with a student we did in the clinic where we had someone who was relatively class three and they wanted to try to correct that with a normal class one bite when we did a denture of just the upper teeth. I'm like, well, let's make two trial dentures. You know, we did the exact same setup, moved one out to be 
class one, left the other and end to end, printed it so they fit exactly the same, the teeth are exactly the same, everything is the same, except we correct the class three into a class one. Print them both in, try them out, you know, the correction worked. And she's like, wow, this looks great. And it's one of those that you can set it in wax, but how good are you at wax? I mean, I'm not the best at it. Um, and then how consistent is that going to be? And then when you send it to your lab, is it really going to be what it was in your hand with the heating and cooling of the materials? You know, we did this digitally, we 3D printed it, we know what we have. Then, how can we improve our methods or prostheses with these technologies? Right? This is another one that's changing a lot, why there's so much research into dentures, is a lot of what we think of a denture has to do with the limitations of acrylic in its traditionally fabricated way. You put a post palatal seal on your denture because you know it's not really going to be in contact with the palate anymore after it sets and it shrinks. When you manufacture it in a method with high fidelity, like printing or milling, it still fits, and so you can get a better adaptation, and so you can worry less about vestibular extension because you're not trying to grab hold of everything because it's actually fitting intimately with the soft tissue. So we're getting much better fits. Uh, I mean, in a subjective uh, experience, but frequently when I give patients milled dentures or always can tell a difference. I mean, it's still acrylic, and I've heard, you know, phrased a few different ways, but kind of summarize it's usually, wow, these feel more like teeth. They don't feel like a denture because you can set it in the computer, give it a minimum thick or a uniform thickness of two and a half millimeters or three millimeters or two, depending on what you're making out of it, instead of the big bulky hunk of acrylic that's in the mouth. And if you make it big and bulky, it's thin elsewhere. So then you create a stress point where it's likely to break. And so, you know, just by making it uniform in thickness, you then change some of the mechanical properties. And so this is, again, well, you can go on forever down this rabbit hole of, well, what if I change this with how it's made? What's that going to do to it? And then, how are the materials going to interact differently? Because if you have a 3D printed denture and you try to soft line it, you're going to notice it doesn't stick at all. I mean, this is still the same resin acrylic that you're using, but you're getting different interactions, which is, shows that there's something different happening at the surface and then at the crystal structure of how the materials are going together. This one doesn't have an answer yet, and it's something I'm intrigued by because I've been noticing that just in my own patients. Like, this is weird. Something needs to be changed. I mean, I just sandblasted them, and it might work for a couple of days, whereas I mean, anybody who's removed soft liner from a denture knows how awful that is of sitting there grinding, and it's all gummy and doesn't want to come off. Uh, if it's been a day, you just grab and peel the whole thing out with your finger, which isn't the best because that means it's collecting food debris and getting real nasty if a patient's wearing it. So that's weird. And then the big question, does biofilm adhere differently to an additive manufacturing prosthesis? And it does seem to be the case. And this is a part that I'm getting into some actual more research research here in a little bit. And this is a project I did with Dr. Kim when he was here. We bought four of the cheapest 3D printers we could find online and made a surgical guide with all of them and then compared them to industry standard 3D printers in dentistry and then used our lab scanners and metrology software and realized that you know, one of these printers that I've seen as low as $169 can make a surgical guide as well as a $10,000 dental printer. And so it's one of those, the technology is becoming available to everybody. I mean, that one was kind of interesting, it's, but in a lot of ways this is product testing. It's like, well, let's see how these three products are different from each other, which one's the best. I mean, in terms of well, what's different about them, this was another thing of more just a novelty is I found when I'm grinding on 3D printed dentures that it makes like a fine dust, almost like talcum powder or flour. It's not the big granules of acrylic that's coming off. I'm like, this is weird. And grinding on it feels different. It's harder to grind it, even though they're slightly more brittle. And so it was one of those that I grabbed a couple of Ziploc bags and I ground a few different types of printed denture bases and then a milled denture base versus a traditionally made denture and then had Dr. Wall help me out to figure out how to use the microscope that was in the back and plate these up. It's like, something is weird. I wonder what these look like under microscopy. And you can see tiny spherical dots, tiny spherical dots versus giant chunks of acrylic. And so we're seeing very different properties in terms of you take the same burr, apply the same pressure, it's coming apart differently. It's like, well, what does this mean? I don't know. It's definitely different, but I suspect this has something to do with the way that uh, Fungal hyphae don't tend to penetrate 3D printed denture bases like they do traditionally processed. You're going to have fewer gaps the way you're building, which means we need to look at how are we adhering soft liners, because you always need a soft liner. 3D printed dentures are really the ideal material and technique for interims. You know, if your interim is terrible and doesn't fit after the first week, print another one. 
or put a soft liner in there, use that as your functional impression, scan it, update your file, reprint it so it fits again. But if soft liners don't work, what can we do? Is there some other material that's going to make it work? I don't know. And so this is the very early stage of this. It's so, you know, every time you figure something out, you realize there's some other thing, you know, another layer of, huh, I wonder what this is going to do. I mean, there have been tons of projects overseeing me, all digital dentistry related with various students and residents. I mean, not all 3D printing, but there's just so much that can be done. And some of the research I'm spending more time on goes back to this company, Copper 3D. I was introduced to them through Unimed. They make filaments for uh, FDM or fused deposition modeling printers. And so this octopus that I always bring around to show people is made with their peel active material. It has a copper nanoparticle in it. And so this is an antimicrobial material. They started it using it for uh, prostheses. You can 3D print, so like either uh, hands, like uh, Dr. Zuniga at UNO has worked with them, built the cyborg piece. That's a really cool 3D printed hand prosthesis. And it worked with this company because you can print these. The material is like $100 a pound, so it's not expensive by any means when you think of how heavy you know, a small plastic item can be. And so it's like, what can we do with this? I mean, there's, going to be interesting applications of antimicrobial 3D printable materials. And so I talked with them and, tried, and they sent me some of their nanoparticles. I'm like, well, copper's blue, which can be pretty for something like a night guard, but I don't think anybody wants a denture of that color. This is a clear splint and then added their nanoparticle to it. I mean, I think it's a pretty color, but that's not really something that has a huge application. We're not really worried about overgrowth on splints like we are on something like a denture that's more of a long-term wear every day. But physically, we know it's possible. And so this is one of those. I'm like, this is great. And then I came across some papers. This one's actually from this past year. It's just an interesting paper in the Incorporation of Antimicrobial Agents in Denture-Based Resins is these are primarily organic compounds, which I thought was kind of interesting, because in the engineering and polymer journals I was researching, pretty much everything was inorganic. I mean, there were some quaternary ammonium salts were pretty common, but there's a lot of metal nanoparticles, titanium, copper, gold, platinum. But most of these papers, they were traditionally made, so you're going to make your acrylic, and sometimes they would create the nanoparticles attached to the acrylic and then you make it and it's a big hunk of material and then as it's setting it's squeezing together and you would get the nanoparticles being pushed outside and so and most of them would end up on the surface they would cut it and then the middle of it each layer would be mostly empty it's like well you know we have another fabrication method we can 3d print and that gets over a lot of those problems which was great and then i came across this paper from 2017 <clears throat> the polymethyl methacrylate with titanium nanoparticles in stereolithographic complete dentures it's like, this is amazing, is they 3D printed denture bases with varying percentages of titanium nanoparticles, and they found a percentage that worked really well at completely inhibiting candida growth, and it was 0.4%. And with the FDA, titanium nanoparticles up to 1% can be in food as an additive. I mean, you look at anything white like chewing gum, it's probably titanium dioxide. So this is something that's already generally recognized as safe by the FDA in a percentage that's below what you can have and call something food grade. I'm like, this is amazing. And then uh, they published a follow-up at the end of 2020. I just found this a week or so ago. And uh, I'm going to tell a little bit more about the, you know, it says 18-month follow-up of patient-centered outcomes assessment of complete dentures. Um, it was kind of a letdown. So taking this, I experimented with a couple different particles, obviously the copper and the copper-silver combinations from that company weren't going to work for a denture because they turned them all purple. Um, so I took the denture base, tried out the titanium distribution of the amount, the type of printer, and the way of printing and mixing that I had done. I read their paper and realized there were better ways to do it than they had tried, and so everything worked out perfectly. And for a week, I came in and just hit print on the same file, seeing how long these particles are going to stay in suspension, because you know it's all well and good if I go to a lab and use an ultrasonic dispersal equipment and then go run and 3D print, but dental labs probably don't have that. Dental offices certainly aren't going to have it. So is it something everybody can do, or is it something specialized labs can do? So I was trying to find a way that's you know, reasonable for a dental lab or an office. Tried it out, worked great, went 10 weeks in a row, just printing again and again and again and again, and it worked beautifully. So then I have it, and then, well, let's see how this works against Canada, and then found someone at the, uh, the food science labs over at the innovation campus was able to test one of their grad students with testing this. 
And thanks to some of you for helping me interpret the data, being a, not a biologist, looking at it. I mean, it, it looked pretty underwhelming to me. And at the bottom was the comment from her that in a testing process or an antimicrobial agent against foodborne pathogen, this would not be considered efficacious. Like, well, that's a bummer, is that there's no real difference between the 3D printed with and without the titanium nanoparticles. Going back to their follow-up, this is something I didn't notice initially, and then all other papers that I've read that have to do with 3D printed, the control has always been a traditionally fabricated denture. My control was also a 3D printed just without the nanoparticles, and they both worked well. It's because when you make a denture base via 3D printing, it's not as subject to fungal overgrowth for whatever is going on with the you know, crystalline structure of the surface. So it's one of those, the letdown of like, well, it's great that we know a way of making these that's less uh, subject to this long-standing problem, just kind of a letdown of all this work into it. I'm like, well, maybe it doesn't really work. I mean, still follow-up to be done trying different sizes of nanoparticles and that sort of thing, different methods, but that was one of those. I'm like, looking at it, I'm like, man, even this, the control worked just as well as all the others. And I realized that in this instance, it wasn't the nanoparticle doing anything. It was the fabrication method. So, kind of a letdown, but also interesting and good that we have, you know, it's a totally new way of looking at something. It's like, well, we're going to really minimize fungal overgrowth just by using the same resins made a different way. But we also know that we can predictably incorporate particles into a 3D printed denture base. Then there's other newer materials. And so this is the printer that's hiding back in the research area from the Nebraska Bankers Association grant. It's huge, it's taller than me. They thing on top they call a mohawk, which cracks me up. Um, <laughs> this is designed for high temperature materials, and so peak and pectin and old tem, uh, they're used a lot in the aerospace industry. Um, like Boeing's space capsule replaced a lot of their actual metal with these materials because they are very strong and very light. And when you 3D print them, you can create any sort of shape that you want, and then you get into the you know, different orientation of layering and changing mechanical properties, and so there's a lot of potential uses with this. You can find these materials in implant dentistry to some degree. There were human trials using PEAK for dental implants that I don't believe uh, went anywhere. You can use PEAK for um, a lot of surgical applications. The first human uses were for spinal fusion cages. Oral surgery, they use it for like orbital floors. As so you put in titanium, eventually the bone is going to adhere to it and you're not going to want to remove it. PEAK is pretty inert, so you can put it in there and know that six months after the bone is healed, you can just pop it right out. And so it has a utility because you can implant it in humans, but it's not going to osteointegrate. So if you want something to stay put as a scaffold that you're going to take out, works great. Plus you can make complex shapes. You can make a spider web shape that you want <coughs> bone to fill into and just leave it behind. And so there's new things that you can create that you know may not have come around. You can get uh, implant frameworks made out of this. So it, the product names, there's Juvora is one, and Trinia is another. That's a fiber reinforced peak that are made for milling because there were no readily available printers for printing. So there are a few labs that could heat process and make you know, ingots or pucks for milling, but it's a material that we know we can get away with milling, you know, a fixed hybrid type framework. But then since we're 3D printing it, what sort of, can you make a lattice work that you can then infiltrate with other materials between it? And I've seen some of the processing, you'll know, 3D print this and essentially make a, almost like a PDS jig around it that you can then inject composite into it so that it cures around and into it. So you can make a, a fixed hybrid using composite with this as a backbone. So it's gonna be a little less likely to chip than acrylic. But these are, you know, they've been in the market for five years tops, some of these. And so totally new material with wildly different mechanical properties. So, this might be a revolution, but it might also be something that 10 years from now, I'm like, oh, I remember when we used to try that out. Turns out it doesn't do what we thought. But, <laughs> but then we look at what methods do we have access to? Because we have quite a few. I mean, in-house, we have SLA, DLP, which are both liquid resin variations, kind of the same thing. And then we have FDM printing, both of this beast that can do the high temperature materials and then $150 inexpensive ones that can print just regular food grade plastics. And then UNL at the Nano Engineering Core Facility, they can use you know, the direct metal laser sintering, and they can print in titanium, stainless steel. They can do cobalt chromium with their equipment. I talked to them about that. They haven't done it yet. And so like, well, if you have a project, um, you just need to buy the materials. 
But when you're buying the powder, you know, it comes with like five kilo of fine powder for a thousand bucks. It's like, well, I need 10 grams. <laughs> so that's not going to work. <laughs> and then like through dental designs here in Lincoln, I've had them make a few items uh, for prototyping of things. They have multi-jet, so I had them print some type of teeth with various densities of like carious material in there to try out making our own version of the multi-material tooth. And so I mean, there's a lot of neat things that can be done. And then clip is a, a new type of very fast, very accurate lithography type printing. And just in the last couple of months, I've seen some papers on lithography produced zirconia crowns. And so that's something that is technically available still in the experimental stage. But you now if we can 3D print zirconia effectively, we can probably make really interesting full arch shaped restorations. Because I mean, milling those, they're giant and they center for a day and then you're grinding back a bunch. But if you may be able to build this thing and then you're not going to be subject to the same manufacturing process. You could hollow it out so they're not heavy. If anybody in here has placed a full arch zirconia uh, implant supported restoration, they've got some heft to it. So can you hollow it out? Probably. I mean, you can't mill it and hollow it out, but if we're printing, we can create different shapes to get to the same thing. So one of the uh, motivating things that I always joke with students is, you know, haven't failed and found 10,000 ways that don't work. And there's a lot of that in digital dentistry in general is Many of my great ideas that I come up with on the way to work, I spend an hour or something like, okay, well, I know that's not going to work next time I try it. As long as I uh, you know, keep it with the creativity and my tolerance for frustration allows it, <laughs> so keep moving forward on it.